It seems to me in my experience with unity that you do not ask your worshipers to stand as quivering children before a punishing divine parent figure. It seems to me as I watch unity deal with its children that you celebrate the lives of your children. You don't tell them that they were born in sin. You do not conceptualize God as an external rescuing presence and you do not conceptualize human life as broken, fallen, depraved, and in need of rescue. Rather, when I'm in unity communities, I hear God spoken of as the experience of life, calling people to live more fully. I hear God spoken of as the power of love, calling people to love more wastefully. I hear God described in the words of Paul Tillich, as the ground of being, calling people to have the courage to be all that they were created to be. You seem to me to be in the business of enhancing life, not degrading life. And in the process, either consciously or unconsciously, you seem to me to have moved away from that external, judgmental, supernatural, miracle-working God who comes in from the outside to bring salvation. And you've moved away from that definition of human life as fallen, deprived, lost, depraved, in need of rescue, in need of redemption. Perhaps you are one of the few that has noticed that no one is ever helped by being told how wretched they are. Is that helpful to you? To have people come up and tell you regularly how wretched you are? How sinful, lost, deprived, depraved? Can you imagine parents being told that the proper way to raise their children was to tell their children every day, look kid, you were born in sin, you are a worthless worm and then expect that child to grow up into being a whole person? The fact is that Christianity, as it has been traditionally interpreted, has constantly victimized its worshipers throughout history. And victimized worshipers always become victimizing people. So maybe we ought to look back at our Christian history as Christianity has journeyed through history, it has always had a victim. Victimized people always have a deep need to pass the victimization on, to get rid of it by victimizing others. That's a strange kind of religion, but how deeply that has infected traditional Christianity. So look at our history. First thing we Christians did, and it starts in the New Testament, is that we taught our people it was okay to hate Jews. We defined Jews as subhuman, eminently hateable, re responsible for the death of Jesus. Nothing we could do to them was bad enough to punish them properly for their evil. And we go from the work of Chrysostom and Jerome and Irenaeus and Polycarp who described Jews as vermin unfit for life to the 14th century where the Christian world blamed the Jews for the bubonic plague to the 16th century where Martin Luther, the great reformer, called for the burning of Jewish synagogues to the 20th century where Adolf Hitler exterminated six million Jews while Pius XII and the Christian nations of the United States, Great Britain, and Canada stood by in benign neglect while that murderous rage took place. Anti-Semitism has been deep in the soul of the Christian West, and the Jews have paid a tremendous price for our own victimization. And it wasn't enough just to victimize Jews. The next thing we Christians did, the next victim we set up, was what we called heretics. 
Those were the people who suggested that there might be another way to experience or even talk about the presence of God. And so we burned them at the stake in droves. And then we hated scientists. We, all, we did put to death Giordano Bruno for suggesting that the earth was not the center of the universe. He did that a hundred years before Galileo. And we condemned Galileo to die, to be burned at the stake, but a plea bargain worked because he had friends in high places and a daughter who was a nun. And so he wound up recanting publicly, refusing ever to write again and accepting house arrest for the remainder of his days because he suggested what in 1991 the Vatican finally said was true. We hated the scientists because they challenged the worldview that supported our religious definitions. And they weren't our only victims. We then, we Christians, dehumanized people of color. Do you know that the greatest century of Christianary, Christian missionary expansion was the 19th century? But it was also the century of white Europe's military and economic domination and colonialization of the third world. And that's how the converts were made. When you dehumanize people of color, then you can justify enslaving them. And so we did. Even the Pope has owned slaves in history. And have you ever acknowledged or looked at the strange relationship between religion and slavery? Are you aware that it was in the Bible Belt of the South, the land of my birth, that slavery was instituted and defended? This is where people read the Bible more regularly than in any other part of the country, where they go to the churches more than they go any other part of the country, where they're more overtly religious, where Jesus is constantly mentioned and God is in the public arena. There's a bank in Mississippi that advertises, Jesus saves, why don't you? It's a God-conscious realm, and that's the realm where slavery became the law. What's that connection? Victimized people always have to have a victim. And when slavery was about to die in the 19th century, it was the Bible-reading, church-going Christians of the South that went to war to preserve it. And they gave up slavery only because they lost the war. And then they created slavery's bastard stepchild called segregation. And in an interesting compromise, a political compromise, in the election of 1876, when Rutherford B. Hayes won a minority popular vote, but majority by one electoral vote over Governor William Tilden of New York, every contested southern state, and one of them was Florida, you might imagine, and that's true, every contested southern state gave its vote to Rutherford B. Hayes so that he won by one electoral vote. And what was the quid pro quo? He agreed to remove Union forces from the South and to allow segregation to become the law of the land, a kind of legalized slavery. 